Um, so this year, um, as you know, marks the third year since the earthquake, tsunami, and the year about that happened again in March of 2011. And while physical disaster is a thing of the past, its aftermath, aftermath is very much the same as the Fukushima is still recovering, reconstructing, and fashioning a sense of a new normal. However, as coverage of the triple disaster has all been faded from mainstream media and everyday conversation, it's easy to forget that it's reality. At this symposium, we want to show why Fukushima is still relevant. We want to show you why Fukushima is still relevant in a way that will hopefully really resonate with all of you. And what better way to do so than through personal stories? So today, we'll give you personal stories to weave a larger narrative that will elaborate upon two things. First, the current state of Fukushima and the ordinary everyday lives of those who live there. And two, why people, whether from Japan or from the United States, choose to live in Fukushima amidst economic, social, structural, and nuclear constructions. So the way that today is going to work is that we'll start out with Professor Helen Bridelli, um, who will provide a psychological perspective on why people might stay in a recovering disaster shipping area. We'll then move on to two documentaries, one by Emily Tabucci, who unfortunately cannot join us today um, because she's in California, but, um, and the other by Jake Price. Um, both of these will get some background on the current state of Fukushima as well as the lives, concerns, and hopes of Fukushima residents. We will then have three speakers from different backgrounds, Serena Winchell, Yuhei Suzuki, and Yusuke Kato, who will talk about their personal motivations for staying in Fukushima. And before we before we begin, I want to thank those who had a hand in planning and supporting this symposium. Um, big thank you to Friends of Japan, Columbia Japan Society, Japan Study Student Association, and my fellow members of the Consortium for Japan Relief um, for helping conceptualize this symposium and bring it to reality. Um, and thank you also to the Japanese American Association, the Center on Japanese Economy and Business at Columbia Business School, Columbia University Weatherhead East Asian Institute, Japanese Medical Society of America, Japanese Medical Support Network, and the Vice President's Office for Diversity and Community Affairs for your generous contributions that really made this symposium possible. And thank you also to N Japanese Gregory, who um, is catering our symposium for the third time. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President, Kenny Nakazawa, who will um, introduce our first speaker. Thank you so much for coming today. It's a Sunday. I know that subways were working so well today. Um, big thank you, Kirsten, President of the Consortium for Japan Relief. Um, I've been working for this past year. It's been a pleasure. Um, and today we have a great panel of speakers. Um, first up is Dr. Ellen Ridelli. Um, Dr. Ridelli is an associate professor at Teachers College, um, a, a professor of special psychology. Um, her research focuses on um, IPT, interpersonal psychotherapy, CBT, cognitive based therapy, um, with adolescents and adults. Um, today, she will be talking about um, the mental impact of a traumatic disaster, such as the one that occurred three years ago in um, the Tohoku region. Um, so, without further ado, it's Dr. Donald Jelly. College faculty, I would like to thank you uh, and welcome you for foregoing this rare sunny day and coming to join us for the commemorations of this event. Um, so, I do global mental health and I focus on the invisible wounds, uh, the effects uh, of mental health of people exposed to disasters. Now, this is an extreme disaster. Uh, in the great earthquake of Japan three years ago, there was this uh, extreme adversity, as the trouble signatures they call it, because the earthquake, the tsunami, and the radiation releases. Everybody knows about the radiation for these three reasons. So, uh, so we have the exposure to uh, natural disasters <coughs> of extreme magnitude and human generated radiation hazards. Uh, this is a very complex situation because, uh, unlike, say, the tsunami, you know, where people eventually adapt uh, 
and the recovery environment improves. Uh, the disaster, this specific disaster, really influences the recovery environment because of the radiation. Um, in global mental health, we have guidelines, we have the uh, interagencies that are competing for mental health and psychosocial support in emergency systems. And the guidelines say that in the beginning, after the disaster, it's not a good idea for us to go and start doing our psychotherapies to offer our packages to people right and left. People are very affected in the beginning. Uh, they have horrified and the first thing you need to do is to assist the community if they want assistance uh, to mobilize the resources, a collective trauma needs collective people. So, uh, so the first step is to mobilize key mental health and psychosocial supports uh, that come from the communities themselves. Um, I had uh, become very involved with the meditation um, program for you know, mental health consultations, not just after the earthquake, but all the disasters that followed you know, over there. The situation on the ground there was uh, unbelievable. You know, there all NGOs the next day doing all these things. Fortunately, here, uh, the community does with that. Um, it's very important to help build available resources and available capacities. And something that is important to do is a lot of psychoeducation. What do I mean by that is um, what happens many times, thank you. What happens many times in disaster settings is uh, in the beginning people feel very united and after a while, irritability settles in, and the fragmentation because of the trauma settles in, and people start fighting, uh, people start withdrawing. You see a lot of divorces. Uh, I understand now there is this phenomenon called nuclear divorces here in Fukushima. So it's very important to, uh, you know, inform people that what happens is not because of their relationship, but because of the effects of trauma. Um, this is the, uh, the guidelines. Do you see the specialized services are in the top? Uh, you need to start doing these other, uh, you know, steps first. So, what do we know about the distressing effects? Uh, there was a, this study on the psychological status of the uh, Fukushima workers, very shortly after uh, the disaster, two to three months. So, it was really very recent. Uh, these were the full-time workers uh, from the two areas, ancient and dining plants. They uh, gave them some report questionnaires uh, validated, you know, for the local setting, um, and, and assessed their experiences, which included the discrimination and marginalization, that's what they presented. Uh, they were incredibly uh, very general, uh, very high distress and post-traumatic disorders were very common and higher rates were found uh, among workers of the Tachi than Tain because there was higher exposure with edge of disaster related stressors. Um, so general psychological distress and post-traumatic symptoms and post-traumatic uh, responses. Um, so it's very, very important to uh, pay attention to the uh, post-disaster environment. Um, lack of community, lack of social acceptance. We know everybody's experience also the, 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 uh, the veteran from Vietnam. Um, really is a poor prognostic sign for adjustment of people exposed to the disaster. So in the community, we have a, a nice study that happened nine months after the earthquake. And in 241 evacuees uh, from the area, and they completed measures of uh, depression, resilience, and impact of events. Um, and again, they were, uh, what they used is um, validated measures uh, 
uh, locally. So uh, they found, uh, again, very, very high levels uh, of uh, close to 50%, sorry, uh, 50% uh, people had elevated symptoms, 14% of people had uh, severe clinical disorders. Not everybody did. And the work of um, our, um, you know, this community, a teacher's college, and George Gonzalo is a great um, colleague of ours, uh, also reminds us that in the beginning of every disaster, you know, there is severe psychological distress. And after, you know, close to a year, the majority of people will eventually adjust, but people who have been severely exposed continue being symptomatic. <coughs> so, um, the question that many, many of you ask is, why do people stay there? Why do they leave? Um, many people have very strong reasons to stay. Right? Old, sick parents, uh, this is a picture, you know, this gentleman here, he didn't want to leave his animals. Their farmers are very attached to the animals, the cows. This other gentleman here who was rescuing dogs, pets that people left behind because they couldn't get them shelters. So people have uh, some very strong reasons to stay, you know, in these, uh, where they are, because of their attachments. But also, um, they have strong reasons to stay because of some of the discrimination they experience. And Serena is going to talk a little about that. Actually, she told me one of the most heartbreaking things I, I heard was that people really avoided, uh, you know, the evacuees from uh, Fukushima, uh, slashed, you know, the tires, and pretty much, she said, like it happened in Hiroshima, you know, and many years ago, because they felt that they could be contaminated. So people were really marginalized. There's also some defiance. Uh, after trauma, many times we see people who want to show that what happened is not going to change them. It's not, you are not going to make me, you know, change my life. That, there is, that makes many people feel very strong. And also there was a lot of mistrust of official information, you know, how, when, when people couldn't, you know, really realize that they, you know, to a good conclusion about what was happening, um, they said, I'm going to make my own decisions. So I was reading about this nuclear disaster, and the nuclear divorces. Uh, all the families were, typically the mother was really worried about the children and their health. Then the father wanted to stay, and the family was brought um, We are all of us very aware of the heartache of disasters. But in global mental health, we learn to see also disasters sometimes as opportunities, opportunities for change. So, Shikha uh, Saxena at the World Health Organization, um, you know, was saying that one of the things that could happen, one of the good things of this prevention important event, but to, for people to update their attitudes uh, towards mental health. Um, and, and uh, decrease stigma. So, for example, you know, in, for physical wounds, right, we never think twice about taking care of the person. We don't ask, why is he wounded? Why is this wound infected? Is he weak? Uh, is it justified that he's so wounded? We don't ask about that. We want to help the person get better. Uh, we don't do that sometimes in, in mental health start uh, thinking that the person who has symptoms is um, So it may be a good opportunity to, uh, to sympathize. Also to strengthen the actual mental health systems. Because there is no help without mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zelli. I think she highlighted the fact that Fukushima disaster did not only have a 
physical effects on people there, like how to see psychological impacts on the rest of the 